Okay, guys, welcome back. Now, in this part of the lecture, we'll get into some of the specifics on lung transplantation. So uh, the first human lung transplant was done in 1963 by Dr. James, uh, James Hardy. Um, he was the first one to perform it on a, you know, a living human. Uh, before this, Dr. Hardy and his team performed approximately um, 400 transplant experiments on dogs. So a little bit of insight, uh, transplantation, you know, medicine and, and, and physiology and research. Um, typically, we, we practice this in um, animal models first. So it'll be done maybe in mice, then dogs, maybe pigs, and then maybe uh, monkeys or some sort of chimps, and then uh, maybe humans. So um, it's usually done, again, you know, you know, a lot of different animals first, multiple times before we even attempt um, at doing this in a human. Um, so the patient was a 50-year-old man who had lung cancer, um, obstructing the airway, all kinds of problems. Um, he was actually a prisoner, um, which you know, people you know, wouldn't you know, um, have sometimes take exception to that, but it was a, it was a breakthrough in medical, medical science. Uh, unfortunately, the patient only lived uh, 18 days as well. Um, it was due to kidney failure. Uh, the first actual successful transplant um, was actually 20 years later um, in 1983 by the Toronto Lung Transplant Group. Um, and the patient, I think, had lived at that time for about at least three years um, afterwards. So again, the first one was in 1963, so similar to heart transplants. Like it started in the 60s. People came up with these ideas. Um, but it didn't really start taking on because until the 80s, due to you know, the, the lack, we didn't have these cyclosporin immunosuppressants. Like that was just a big limiting factor. Um, so um, I generally think like lung transplants have a greater risk for exposure because the organ that's, you know, the, the, the transplant organ is the lungs and you're always breathing in air. Um, so we typically try to keep patients in a sterilized environment, especially when they're exercising and when they're out in the community. Um, heart, right? Like, you know, you're not, you know, whatever you breathe in is not going directly to your heart. Whatever you're breathing in is going directly to your lungs. So you know, just something to consider there. Uh, about 2,500 lung transplants were done in the United States. Uh, to, in 2017, 2,478 were done. So we're, we're doing a little bit more every year, and we'll go over about some of the trends that we see in terms of the type of procedures that are done. So if we look at uh, total number of transplants, and this is, again, international data, so the, the trends are increasing, right? We're seeing more and more of uh, these done. Again, this has to do with um, the advancements in technology. Again, cyclosporin, um, calcineurin-based, you know, this calcineurin-based immunosuppressants didn't really come on the scene until the 80s. And now that they're there, patients are living longer. Um, like I mentioned, the first one was done in 1963, um, the guy only lived for 18 days, and the really first successful one was in 1983, and the guy lived for about um, three years. I think at that time they had interviewed him. I'm not sure how long he lived overall. Um, but we're seeing more and more of these. And the unique thing about lungs is that we can potentially give some patients a single lung. Um, so typically this was reserved for patients with an um, restrictive type disorder, like a, an interstitial lung disease like IPF or sarcoidosis, where we can give them a single lung. Um, COPD, we often do a bilateral lung um, transplant because of some of the pressure changes that can occur. Um, so the advantages of a lung transplant, like we can potentially save two patients if the lungs are the right size, if they're the right match, um, you know, two patients with one from one donor. So it's, you know, it can be, can be uh, quite a benefit to those patients. So again, just looking at um, the, the increases in, in over time. And again, also due to the fact that um, you know we're just we have better trained, we have more trained clinicians, more transplant centers available, because um, more people know how to do this stuff and manage these cases. And if we look at uh, retransplants by year and location, um, you know the trends have um, you know gone up a bit. Um, we see higher overall numbers in the United States. Um, and again, the per the percentage you know, hovers around four to five percent of all procedures. And again, some of that has to do with the fact that overall numbers are also increasing. So while we've seen almost a doubling in the number of retransplants internationally from 60 to about, you know, 160, 140, the overall number of transplants has also increased. Again, if we look at, you know, over, over time as well. 
Now, um, looking at the number of people who get retransplanted within a uh, time frame, so looking at the first, you know, one to three years and the five to ten years, where we see the larger percentage of um, you know retransplants. So really, a after the first year is where we're going to see the bulk of them done. Um, again, the concern, um, and I've actually seen this clinically, where a patient, uh, the organ just didn't take, um, and you know we were, you know, we we tried a lot of different options, and we tried maybe looking at retransplanting him because just the organ wouldn't take, and we needed to get a new a new lung in there. So um, these are some of the conditions. So the the leading leading causes again, looking at um, COPD and then different types of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and then, you know, other, other different types, um, you know, cystic fibrosis, um, bilateral transplants, right? A larger port percentage of them. Um, and, you know, total, total transplantation again, COPD being our leading one, leading one, other fibrotic conditions, we'll get into those. And then cystic fibrosis are, are kind of our top three reasons for why someone would get a lung transplantation. So COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, and then a cystic fibrosis. Uh, transplants with, with undiagnosed are uh, not included, so there are some people who get lung transplants that aren't uh, one of these conditions. So um, looking at diagnostic year, right, so these are the individuals who get um, a lung transplant for those major diagnoses we mentioned, like COPD, cystic fibrosis, um, those interstitial lung conditions. If we look at, uh, there's been a change, right, so it's kind of kind of unique. Um, in cystic fibrosis, um, we had done a, you know, we were doing single lung transplants for many years. And then we've seen, you know, well, maybe these patients do a little bit better if we transplant both lungs. Um, and the concern from this came from, uh, you know, if we, if we have that one hyperinflated lung still in the mediastinum, potentially it could compress the other side. Um, so we need to re we're going to replace both instead of just leaving the one in there just to keep, you know, um, you know again, our goal from an, for an organ transplant is to make sure the transplanted organ is as, you know, has the best option, opportunity for success as possible. So this is why we're seeing uh, that use. Now, in uh, patients with like pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, um, for many years, they, we were doing singles primarily, right? And we'll show a graph that really demonstrates this, right? However, we started realizing that, you know, maybe it might not be a bad idea to kind of still do, um, you know, doubles in those patients too. So you're seeing a, a larger number of those getting double lungs uh, as well. So there's been some, tr some changes. Uh, generally for COPD, it's gonna be a, a bilateral transplantation. Alpha antitrypsin one, which is can cause a type of COPD. It's almost always a double lung transplant. Um, in uh, pulmonary fibrosis, you may still see a significant number getting a single lung because you're not gonna change, that lung is not hyperinflating, it's actually kind of getting smaller. So you're not concerned about that one getting compressed. Cystic fibrosis, it's almost always gonna be a double lung transplant. Very rarely do they get a, a, a single lung. And it's looking again at the um, percentage again there's been a change right COPD we moved from single lung to almost everyone or large or the majority now are getting uh, double lung transplants whereas with I you know IIP we still the you know there's still a large percentage right um, that get um, single lungs but you know we're seeing more and more of them getting bilateral as well Um, now, if we look at the, the distribution of ages, again, uh, younger populations, we're thinking probably more cystic fibrosis, um, and then older, right, there are COPD, IPF causes. Um, so that's what we were there. And then indications, right? So uh, emphasis even one or alpha one into trypsin deficiency, cystic fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension. Again, if we think the pulmonary hypertension is related to hypoxemia, our hypoxia, right? And we talked about the, the changes that happen in the vasculature when we have low oxygen or high carbon dioxide. So we think, hey, maybe we correct that. We could improve uh, the pulmonary vasculature. A retransplant, we talked about it's like 5%-ish of cases. 
a congenital defect was taken like cystic fibrosis or, or other other or, or non cystic fibrosis other congenital defects to the lungs sarcoidosis RA or someone who has a very significant um, trauma following a burn or even like a you know blast injury of some kind and then looking again uh, the trends over time uh, again you know these different 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 percentage breakdowns of who's getting um, a lung transplant. COPD stayed stable around 30%. You see an, a higher percentage now looking at um, those you know, pulmonary fibro fibrotic conditions. And again, um, you know, again, looking at the trends over time in terms of number of transplants. Again, this is global data. Um, so, you know, it's not exactly the same as USA, but it's just good understanding of how things are kind of working at overall trends and, and the absolute numbers. So the absolute numbers of COPD have increased, but these IIPs, right, are a little bit different. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more of these being done. So yeah, the IIPs are these, uh, these you know, pulmonary um, you know, fibrotic kind of conditions. Um, so contraindications to a um, lung transplant, um, uncontrolled infection or tubercul uh, tuberculosis or TB, like obviously not going to put a, a fresh, healthy lung in someone with TB. Uh, uncontrolled coronary artery disease, active malignancy, um, significant dysfunction of other organs, chest wall deformities. Again, like we want to again make sure that someone um, is able to, you know, they're going to survive with good outcomes. Um, as well as we don't want someone who's super obese. Like it's the same concerns um, as a heart transplant. Like again, if someone's obese, their those lungs, they're, they're going to have problems with those lungs, right? Um, just because we know what what obesity does to the lungs. So. Um, you know, so we don't want patients to be super underweight, but we don't want them to be, you know, more than a BMI of about 35. And we also, um, in some facilities, consider, like, the inability to participate in a rehab program, um, sometimes even prior. Um, so that's institutionally dependent. Like, we want people to be engaging typically in a, um, you know, a pre-transplant rehab, but most assuredly in a post-transplant rehabilitation program. We'll get into that a little bit later, too. Uh, but again, every institution is a little bit different. And then guidelines, um, clinically and physiologically severe disease, ineffective medical therapy, um, limited life expectancy due to lung disease. Again, are, are they going to survive that, that year, right? Do they need to get something replaced? And we want their nutritional status. Again, we don't want them super underweight, right? If their BMI is really low, like they're not, probably not going to survive the transplant, um, getting that Bode index, right? Um, and if they're, you know, super obese, right, super overweight, um, that's a concern too because of what happens with, with obesity and how that affects the lungs. And then, just like we had mentioned, do they have adequate you know, psychosocial resources and support, right? Because it, you need to make sure these patients know what they need to be doing after they have this organ transplant or it's going to be a big problem. Um, so looking at uh, how we decide how a patient gets along, so like I mentioned, it's a little bit different. Um, we use a lung allocation score, which factors in uh, – in general, the weightless urgency, like how like how urgent the case is this, how long, um, what's their likelihood of surviving, and what's their likelihood of surviving after transplant, right? Like what what's their likelihood of surviving? If we give them this lung, are they going to actually make it a year, right? So we looked at you know expected days lived without a transplant, and expected days lived following the first year post transplant. We want to make sure that you know the patients we're, again we're giving the organ the best opportunity for success because there's plenty of people who aren't getting this organ. Um, so we factor in the FEC, pulmonary pressures, you know, like we mentioned, the BMI, six-minute walk test, and uh, functional status is kind of where we really play a role in because you may be assessing this if you're part of a transplant team. I was, um, you know, back in the day. So uh, these are all different factors that are, are included. And here's just an example of kind of the, uh, the, the weighting list model that we use for lung allocation score, and it gives you all the different weights that get factored in. Like there's an actual, like, formula that, that that assesses this, right? So we look at functional status, we look at forced vital capacity, six minute walk test distance, um, and to see like what, you know, and then these all the all these other factors, like what's their, you know, what's their urgency for them getting needing to get this lung. And then we get a score calculated and uh, and that you know determines your priority for for, for transplantation. All right, so uh, the procedures involved for lung transplantation, so a uh, single lung transplant, um, you will get a thoracotomy, and we'll show what that looks like. And we talked about this a bit already. 
Um, this is also what's done for a lung resection, a lobectomy. So it's just one side of the chest wall is open. We can um, you know, remove the diseased lung and input in the uh, healthy lung. For a double lung transplant, you're typically gonna see a clamshell procedure done. Um, so they will open up uh, both sides of the rib cage, reflect it up open, makes it look like a clamshell. Um, and we'll show you what that looks like in a bit. Um, this is an example, again, of the uh, how we keep the lung, perfu the lung perfused and alive. Again, remembering, you know, you only got like four to six hours to keep a lung alive after it's been harvested. Um, so we use these devices to kind of keep uh, those uh, transplanted organs alive. I check out this video here. Um, I have it linked below to show you what this looks like. Um, it's kind of kind of neat. Um, so yeah, they'll keep it inflated and keep it keep it perfused. Pretty 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 neat. So um, this is an example here of how the clamshell procedure is done. Again, we're gonna cut open the rib cage here and reflect it open. Right, so we can expose both lungs. So again, we're going to use this for for uh, a bilateral lung transplant. Uh, significant, sometimes pain, because again, like you know, you're, after transplantation, obviously, because we've now re you know reflected open the entire chest wall. And then a thoracotomy is an example of that, where again, we're only just going to one side, right? Um, and this is typically done for a single lung transplant. Now, if we get into some specifics on survival rate, like I mentioned, you know, hearts. We're, we're now we're seeing. Uh, roughly, you know, 12.4 years, at, you know, for, for survival rate, the 50% mark, the median survival rate. Um, if we look at our data here, so our double lung transplant and a single lung, okay, median survival years. So double lung, you're going to get about 7.6, okay? So if we get, to, you know, the 50% survival rate, for a double lung, you know, roughly about 7.6, just under eight years. Single lung, 50%, you know, one year. Now, the median survival is estimated time at which 50% of all survivals have died, right? Um, and the condition, conditional survival rate is the estimated time at which 50% of the recipients who at least survive one year have died. So because the client survival is greatest during the first year following transplantation, the conditional survival provides a more realistic expectation of survival time for patients who survive the early post-transplant period. So the conditional survival rate, um, this, this excludes people um, who die within the first year, right? So again, because we're, we're, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons why that can happen in the first year, but we want to see like, you know, if people get beyond that year mark, which is where anything, can, where, where most of the concerns happen, um, what's their what's their like prognosis? So if we exclude people who die in the first year, the conditional median survival rate is ten years, and then for a single lung, six point five years. So can you know median is overall. This is everyone, including those who die in their first year. Conditional is those who survive the first year. Right? What's what's the survivalhood of those who make it? You know, uh, at least a year. And again, just looking at, you know, looking at um, plotting all transplants, so all primary transplants. So again, realizing that single lung has a little bit lower, even conditional survival rate. Um, overall survival rate for a lung transplant, um, you know, uh, for, a lung, for a lung transplant, bilateral or single is about 6.2 years. We factor in bilateral and single for primary. Retransplant. Um, 3.1, but if we look at conditionally, if you get beyond a year, overall, both single or double, we're looking at 8.3 years, and conditional, um, 6.4 years for retransplant. So um, again, lung transplant, the outcomes for survival are a little bit lower than heart transplant. Again, heart, we're looking at roughly about 12.4, um, and you know, even in conditional for um, lung transplant, 8.3, right? So these are people who get past that first year. And then we look at survival rates have gotten better, right? Like we mentioned, um, just our medications get better every single generation. So where we were at 50% in 1990, 1998 at, you know, 4.3 conditional 7.1, looking at um, our data now from 2009, 2016, um, you know, we're at 6.5 years, 
right? And then our, you know, our conditional is probably going to be even higher. It hasn't been calculated yet. Um, but this is very promising. It looks like almost every every decade or so, we get people another year or so on average is looking at um, you know survival rate, that, that median survival rate. And again, there's there's a you know even even 20, 30 years ago, you know, if we look at there's still 25 percent you know that get to 11 years, right? Some you know a fraction get 20 years, right? So it, it's really an individualized area of medicine. So um, looking at um, again, their survival curve, just looking at the transplant type. So primary versus retransplant. Again, anytime you have a second retransplant, like your survival is not going to be as high. Um, but we've gotten better, obviously, now over time of keeping even those patients alive a little bit longer compared to what we saw, you know, in the, in the 90s, right? So primary um, and our first retransplants. So looking at, you know, 1990, this plot here versus what we see now, like even now that's that's even better than it, than it had been. So we're, we're, we're getting better and better keeping people alive. And again, this is again, looking at conditional um, retransplants is the same kind of concept. Um, in terms of types of conditions, uh, CF typically does a little bit better. That's likely because these are younger populations. So the median survival rate for CF, you know, we're looking at, you know, 10 years, and this is, you know, uh, this is not conditional. This is just primary, it's factoring everybody. Um, and, you know, looking at COPD, five and a half. Um, and then looking at, um, our, you know, our IIPs, 5.2. So cystic fibrosis, we think just because they're younger. Same thing with alpha-1 antitrypsin. There's typically in a younger population. That may explain why we see, um, you know, their survival be a, is a little bit better just because of, you know, it's in a younger population versus COPD and IIPs like IPF, usually a little bit older population. We factor in, um, again, conditional, these are individuals to survive that first three months. Um, again, it, it just shifts those curves a little bit more. So if, if we exclude those who die early, patients with cystic fibrosis, like the survival rate, the median survival rate is, you know, 10.9 years, COPD goes up a little bit, everything goes up a little bit as well. But again, we see better survival hood in CF and uh, alpha-1 intertrypsin because the patients are a little bit younger. Um, and again, if we exclude those who die early, it's, we can get a better indication how do people do you know, long-term, right? And again, if we even further break it down to conditional survival as a year, if you make it past that first year, things then generally get a little bit better. And again, um, that's similar for, 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 for any transplant, um, but particularly for lungs. If we can get past that first year, we know rejection, acute rejection, infections are going to be a big problem. Survival rates for those people who can get beyond that year are typically a little bit better. And it shifts the median survival rate for CF up to 12.2 years. So again, looking at you know who makes it past the, the kind of the tenuous period can give us an indication of how well they're going to do um, long term. If you can get past that first year, things typically, you typically do a little bit better. You know, so get, getting back past that first year. So um, looking at, again, what are the leading causes? So graft failure in the first 30 days, just like heart transplants, is the leading cause. As we move beyond the 30 day, you know, that first immediate period, infections go up, then they come down. Um, and then uh, bronchiolitis, uh, obliterans, we, we know that's a concern as well and that we think that's related to some of the, the immune changes and, and rejection changes. So we see destruction potentially in the in the airways uh, with you know long term. We think that's related to some of the immune response attacking the, the graft. And again, looking at the uh, causes of the death, like I mentioned, the first immediate period is we're looking at um, graft failure and then that shifts to infections. And we also see different cancers become more popular and then that that bronchiolitis, obliterans, um, again, that's a big um, you know, concern post-transplant just because of some of the immune changes that will happen that may damage and, and destroy the airways. Um, and then looking at, again, um, survival-free. So bronchiolitis, um, obliterans syndrome, or, or BOS, um, is, it's, it's scarring the small airways. It leads to narrowing, limiting airflows. About half of transplant recipients develop BOS uh, within the first five years of transplantation. It's one of the 
reasons why we look at FEV ones. Like not only is it a sign of rejection, but it could be a sign of this developing this bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. And again, we, we see it, it becomes pretty common in, in patients. And in fact, after, you know, you know, maybe five years again, you know, 50% will have it, right? So this is percentage of individuals free who do not have it after five, you know, five years, we start shifting to the majority of them having it, right? So um, again, it's a condition to be monitoring for, and that's why we have patients um, do those FEV ones. And even if we do that, that conditional people who survive a year, we still see it's pretty pretty similar. So even if we filter out conditional, you know, that conditional survival people who generally do better, we still see it. So we think it may be something related to the immune system response to this organ. Uh, maybe related to the um, uh, rejection processes. Um, but again, so at five years, even if we factor out or, or factor or remove or exclude or control for those who just don't do very well in that first year, we still see the similar similar trends at that five year mark, but you know, 50% um, have it. And then looking at malignancy, like I mentioned, uh, lymphomas are kind of our, our leading one. Um, you know, for uh, the types of cancers we see and uh, the, uh, you know, the freedom from mal malignancies are, if we move, you know, down, right, the longer we stay on those immunosuppressants, the lik higher likelihood we are to, to get some sort of cancer, right? So, um, you know, that is a, always a big concern with this population. And then looking at... Um, severe freedom from severe renal condition again like i mentioned there are some um you know unique changes that happen to the kidneys especially with chronic immunosuppression right it's going to kind of beat up the kidneys and one thing i um want to mention again you know and we'll get into this one again the, the transplant rehabilitation aspect side of this is that peak exercise capacity after a lung transplant specifically only improves like 40 to 60% of what they should be at an age uh, sex matched level, despite that the lungs might do well. Um, two years post transplantation, the, the ranges for six minute walk tests typically only range between 400, 300 to 500 or so feet, um, which is, you know, we want people way higher than that. So what explains that, right? And we'll talk about some of the unique things that happen um, in terms of rehabilitation side um, for lung transplant. But yeah, like even though, you know, in the heart, we may have a, you know, now a he healthy heart in that patient, or these patients with lung transplant may have healthy lungs because we replaced them, their ability to exercise is still impacted. And we'll go into maybe some reasons why and what we can possibly do about it as, as physical therapists and rehabilitation specialists.